Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well today. Um, we began a discussion of the curvature gradient uh, the other day, and we're going to continue with that today. And uh, the curvature gradient is, is uh, often claimed to, uh, or at least, you know, suggested to highlight the uh, fault and fracture zones in seismic data. Uh, you know, you can imagine here in this uh, fold that we have that uh, the um, uh, steeply dipping limb here might be faulted. And uh, if a fault were to cut through the limb over here, that this would be a more intensely fractured zone. And uh, down here we have the curvature. You can see it drops off to a minimum and then rapidly rises up to a maximum. And then the curvature gradient is uh, basically a spike located at the inflection point. Um, in this uh, in this fold. Now over here, if you you remember from the last time, uh, we went through an exercise here using the um, calculated the curvature and the curvature gradient for a simple fold uh, simulated just just using a sinusoid. So this would be the anticline. This would be the syncline you can see that the curvature, we do have a minimum over here, a maximum over here, but that doesn't look much like uh, that shown in the example. We also see that the curvature gradient, uh, this uh, red line here, does not rise up to a peak over the inflection point, uh, but rather is associated with a saddle between two highs in the curvature, uh, curvature gradient. So we do have a result which is quite a bit, uh, we obtained a result which is quite a bit different from the result uh, uh, that we encounter in the, uh, in the literature. So what we're going to do, uh, what we mentioned the last time that we take a look at would be a Chebyshev polynomial. This is a fifth order, simple fifth order polynomial. And you can see that we have a tighter fold here and we'll just go through this calculation. We'll calculate the uh, curvature and the curvature gradient and see if we can get close to this example over here. So this is the this is our inflection point here um, <clears throat> and this is the uh, polynomial expression for the um, uh, for the Chebyshev polynomial. So you, you can see that it, it uh, consists of just the uh, odd powers of x uh, with with some coefficients in there. So again, at the inflection point, we assume that we might have a fault coming through the limb of this anticline syncline pair. This is our uh, the example that we went through the last time. We have a anticline and a syncline. Here we have the uh, curvature, maximum positive, maximum negative, and then you can see that we have the um, curvature gradient down here not rising up to a peak. Um, <clears throat> the question that we would pose is can we bring these two peaks together by tightening up the uh, structure as we've done here and get something that looks uh, looks more like this. So if we compare the uh, Chebyshev polynomial to the uh, example uh, shown here, you can see that it's it's pretty good. It deviates here on the limbs, the flanks rather. It doesn't isn't going to affect our result that much and um, we'll just um, We'll, we'll just see how this uh, works out. And if, so if we go through these computations for the uh, Chebyshev uh, polynomial, uh, we get uh, maximum negative, we get maximum positive, we get the uh, gradient and the curvature again, but uh, in this particular case, um, the, uh, the peaks in the curvature are separated from each other uh, quite a bit, and we, uh, and we really don't get anything that, that looks uh, very much like what we have in the um, in the literature. So fault over here that we're trying to locate, that we're trying to highlight, which in this example is uh, effectively highlighted and emphasized by the curvature gradient. Over here, at least for this fold, it's um, <clears throat> still too broad. Uh, the curvature gradient uh, does not converge uh, at the inflection point like we uh, like we would hope for. So 
Now here we're just using a uh, simple derivative. And if we take the derivative of this structure, we get a peak in the derivative located at the inflection point. So <clears throat> think about it. This is computationally much less intensive than the computation of the curvature gradient, which if you remember the formula there, we have first and second derivatives of the, uh, of the function. We uh, square the uh, <clears throat> we, we square the first derivative in the uh, uh, denominator. Uh, we take 1 plus the square of the derivative and raise that to the 3 halves power. We divide that into the second derivative in the numerator, and then we follow that by another differentiation in order to get the uh, uh, curvature gradient. So this is computationally much less expensive and uh, very simple. Um, it does much less to the data. So, so we do have a result here. Uh, all we needed to do was just take the, uh, take the derivative. Now, what I did was, you know, I'm not ready to give up here. I'll just uh, look at some other functions. I <clears throat> looked at a cubic parabola here, which is y equal to x to the one-third power. Now this structure, we have a steep limb here uh, to get this cubic parabola to look more like this, what I did was um, uh, superimpose a linear rise in this structure here in order to get uh, uh, <clears throat> the cubic parabola plus a line. And that gives us something that looks a lot more like what we have over here. And so let's, uh, let's see how this works out. Uh, it looks like it should you know, work out um, uh, should be very similar to, to what we see in this example. Let's, let's have a look. <clears throat> Again, this would be the location of the fault, steeply dipping limb, uh, most highly fractured area would be in here. And indeed, we, uh, here we get, you know, again, looking at the structure, this is the, uh, <clears throat> this is the curvature, looks very much like what we have in the example. Uh, the curvature gradient, though, rises up, doesn't quite rise up to a peak here. There's a little bit of a notch in the peak. So we were able to bring these two uh, peaks that we saw in the preview exam previous examples together, almost, to a single peak. Uh, whether or not we'd actually see this um, little uh, slice in the peak in our data would really depend on the uh, midpoint spacing in our data acquisitions, we, we might actually see this rise up to a peak. Uh, but in this particular case, we see that we still have some separation between the um, uh, <clears throat> peaks and the curvature gradient. So, so here uh, we come back to the derivative. Uh, the derivative, again, just does an excellent job of uh, highlighting the inflection point here, the most likely location on the fault that's been, location on the structure that will have been faulted, uh, perhaps the most likely location for intense fracturing if you're looking for a fractured reservoir. Remember that we can't forget about flexural flow on the limbs of anticlines. Uh, we would have a, a series of uh, extension fractures here in, this, in these more tightly uh, uh, <clears throat> folded areas, so open fractures might be located in the uh, in the uh, curved regions, the folded regions uh, of the fold, both on the syncline and the anticline. So there are, there are potentially multiple uh, targets here for intensely uh, fractured reservoir, including you know what would be perhaps uh, an intensely fractured zone out in front of the. Uh, <clears throat> of the uh, uh, steeply dipping limb. So uh, just to, you know, in fairness to, to some of the examples that we've shown in the literature, I just digitized this uh, curve. And here's the digitized curve. And I've superimposed it here. So I did, you know, I did a, it's a fairly accurate uh, representation of the curve that uh, we see used as a, an example. And then I went through the analysis there. And in this analysis, we, we get, uh, again, we get uh, maximum negative curvature, maximum 
uh, positive curvature. We see the uh, curvature gradient down here. Again, we haven't really brought these two together, so we're seeing something significantly different than what we see over here. Uh, that was about the best I could do there. This is, you know, the areas in the uh, <clears throat> uh, the flat of the uh, syncline over here and the flat uh, across the uh, crest of the anticline where we would have uh, kind of a maximum uh, positive curvature, maximum negative curvature here. And you can see that the curvature gradient does pretty much what we'd expect. It, it kind of comes in here and decreases to uh, uh, kind of a maximum negative value and then rapidly swings around into positive and then comes up to a peak here and then rolls over again. So we have this kind of a uh, negative followed by a positive over here. The inverse of that uh, positive followed by a negative. But something very different from what we see here. So the best that I've really been able to do is with the uh, cubic parabola. Uh, it seems to um, seems to come closest to matching the result that we've seen in some examples. Uh, we do have this notch here in the uh, peak of the uh, or near the peak of the curvature gradient, but actually we have two peaks there. Uh, and uh, again, you know, when we talked about the sign, the sinusoid. Now, the idea was to see if we could come up with a function that would kind of bring those two peaks together. We've pretty much done that with the cubic parabola, uh, but not quite. So here we have a comparison of um, some of the some of the folds that we've worked with. We have the sinusoid, we have the Chebyshev uh, fold, we have the cubic parabola. Uh, we've gotten some significantly different results in these. Um, uh, three examples, and you, and you have to ask yourself as a geophysicist, as an interpreter, your interpretations are going to vary significantly depending upon whether you have, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, more gradually undulating uh, surface. You may have uh, negative and maximum negative and maximum, maximum uh, positive curvature separated, significantly separated from each other. The curvature gradient may have a saddle in it. Uh, if you're looking if your interpretation says, you know, I'm looking for the peaks, then you've got two areas here that you're potentially, you know, thinking about where you're going to uh, place your your well. If you're going to put your well into an intensely uh, fractured area, then if you're using this, uh, the example in the literature, then you're going for one of the peaks or both of them. Uh, maybe, you know, something like this cubic parabola, we, we'd hit it right on here at the inflection point, but in this case, we would kind of miss this area if this is the area that we were interested in. So, and then I just come back to this idea of the derivative. This is um, the, the derivative really is, is just, um, you know, the, the simplest way to obtain a, uh, and I'm just using the digitized curve here. It's really the simplest way to uh, highlight and uh, the location of the inflection point. If this is what you're looking for, if this is your target, your exploration target, then taking the derivative is the cheapest, the quickest way to find out where these areas are. Again, it's uh, uh, less intensive uh, computationally. Remember to get the curvature gradient first and second derivatives, squaring, three halves power division, an additional differentiation. And uh, this is going to be easier to interpret and more consistent uh, from one area to, to another. So that makes it, it an, important, um, uh, an important approach um, to, to take in um, analyzing your, your data, if this is in fact what you're interested in. I would at least suggest that you just calculate the uh, derivative. Now there are some lessons to be learned. Uh, one, the attribute you use should uniquely define the feature. In this case, uh, it's a structural feature that you're after and you're looking specifically for the location of a reverse fault, the a zone of intense fracturing uh, associated with the uh, fault cutting that limb. Uh, you want to highlight that by this uh, this attribute. 
And uh, second lesson learned is um, you should understand the range of variability and the responses associated with the attribute you select. So failure to appreciate the variety of attribute responses, and we've seen that the uh, curvature gradient can have uh, can, can appear quite differently depending on the depending on the structure that you're looking at, and this could lead to misinterpretation. Um, so so for example, if you think all maximum curvature areas are faults, you'd be wrong. Now in this particular example, we wish to emphasize the seismic response of steeply dipping structure. And we found that a simple derivative will accomplish this with a consistent response represented by a uh, peak at the fold's um, inflection point. So um, that pretty much wraps it up for, for the curvature gradient and um, We'll find some additional topics to uh, talk about that are related to attribute analysis. Probably we'll talk about some regression analysis and so on in the uh, in the next video. But uh, thanks for uh, uh, thanks for listening in, and uh, hope everyone's doing well. And we'll see you uh, see you next.